Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, thank you for having me here to give this lecture. I'm very pleased to be here. I see some friends uh, in the audience, which is extra fun. Uh, I hope what I have to say is interesting and useful for the work you all do. I think some of what I'm going to have to say is, uh, is going to confirm stuff that you know, but I also hope that I have some new ideas and provocative uh, insights for you, and I look forward to the discussion after. So I, too, want to thank the Lake and Buttry family uh, for uh, endowing this lectureship. Uh, but let me get on to what I have to say. So. Um, <clears throat> Instead of starting off with data and findings, I want to start off with a big picture conceptual question of human nature. And the question is, are humans ultimately just selfish or are humans also, in some sense, primordially self-giving? Um, the answer to the question has consequences for how giving might be promoted or encouraged. And we've inherited one particular view that's been the dominant view and that's been changing. And so I want to talk about that for a little bit. The inherited traditional academic view, the dominant one, not the only one, but the dominant one, is something like rational egoism, that human beings are ultimately and finally self-serving. They can, that can express itself looking in lots of ways as if they help other people, but ultimately it gets back to a fundamentally self-oriented, more or less calculating uh, view of the human person. And this uh, Hobbes would have been one person that articulated this kind of approach, but it's shown up in academia and various uh, schools of thought, rational choice theory, certain versions of neoclassical economics, social exchange theory, and as generally as sort of applying Darwinian uh, natural selection to the, the human uh, social world. Um, but there are new scientific perspectives coming into being that I think are very interesting that relate to the question of generosity. And increasingly that comes from realization from scholars in different fields that um, empirical altruism, that is, it seems to happen in the empirical world. People act altruistically. And empirical generosity cannot be reduced to selfish motives. There have been lots of attempts to try to explain, well, when somebody jumps in front of a train to save a complete stranger, they're really being selfish in this way and that way. Or Mother Teresa really was self-interested, or something like this. And, but the accumulated realization that there actually is empirical altruism and generosity that happens in the world that we just cannot explain away in any plausible way. The, those have built up as anomalies and have forced uh, consideration of a different view of human nature. And so increasingly emerging uh, are, uh, is a view of humans as naturally, primordially, and spontaneously, not just selfish, which clearly human beings are, self-oriented, but also self-giving, ready to expend one's own resources and well-being and potentially life for another who may not even be um, known or, bi or biologically related. There's lots of research on this. I'm going to just point to two things very quickly. Neuroscience studies on brain activity, experimental studies on toddlers, but also generally just this theoretical explanation for altruism. We really can't explain it other than having to realize that human beings are more complex than just rational egoists. So one of the projects uh, that my Science of Generosity uh, initiative studies, Dr. Uh, Stephanie Brown, who focuses on um, neuroscience, brain activity of different kind of work, and I'm not going to get in into this at all other than to say her work suggests, and neuroscience is tricky stuff, but suggests that the kind of brain activity that happens when people are behaving generously seems to be very closely related to the kind of brain activity that happens when parents are seeing their infants, pictures of their infants, and their infants crying. So that the, the very, very primordial um, maternal and paternal experiences of one's own closest, most vulnerable, needy children, the brain, what's going on in the brain there seems neuro, uh, 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 the, the region seem to be connected to what also goes on when people are acting generously. That's all I'm going to say about that if you want to hear more. Uh, it's all out there. Um, another project we funded at Harvard by a developmental psychologist um, f 
focused on toddlers, and I want to show a, a few video clips because I think these videos uh, are, are uh, a one video is worth two billion words here. But the idea here is these are experiments of very, very young human beings who haven't even figured out language, and they, they, they're, they're not, they're, uh, the, the, the toddlers are not asked to do anything, they're not directed to do anything, the parent is completely neutral, etc. But it, what it demonstrates is that a certain kind of spontaneous, from within the toddler himself, in these cases, uh, read, interest in helping. So let's see if I can make uh, this work here. I love these videos so much, so I thought I had to show them to you. This is the clothespin video. Okay, you get the idea? Some, maybe Hobbes didn't totally have it right. This is my favorite. This is the cabinet. Oh. Hmm. Oh. Watch the face on this kid. Zoo? So the idea is, um, none of, that doesn't prove anything. It's not an open and shut case. But the idea is the, the assumption of rational egoism, that everyone is just scraping against everyone else to maximize their own uh, power, prestige, status, and wealth. There's something deeper in human nature that goes along with that that matters, that, that those who study generosity need to take seriously. If that's the case, then thinking about how do you cultivate generosity, I think it means that we are not stuck simply, or if you're a fundraiser, it's not, we're not stuck simply extracting losses from rational egoists. It's not just a matter of, it's not in their interest to give, and they really don't want to give. So how can we set up situations to force them to give, or to make them feel guilty if they don't give, make them feel pressured through or provide some selective incentives where they realize the hundred dollars the national public radio really didn't pay for the mug but i'll do it so <laughs> rational egoism can't really explain it but if human being if human nature is more complex than this then we can say that uh what encouraging generosity is about is cultivating natural capacities, not artificial, but natural capacities and tendencies to give that are in human beings, and to cultivate them against, or at least in parallel with, selfish uh, tendencies. So what are the consequences of a multi-capacities view? That is, we, are, we have the capacity to be selfish and giving. What are the, some of the consequences of that for thinking about generosity? Well, the question arises, what kind of social institutional and cognitive emotional resources, or that is processes, sorry, can be uh, in, uh, developed to enhance rather than to retard natural human capacities and tendencies for generous giving. That is, as these toddlers grow up in the world and in different kind of potential societies and institutions that they, and relationships they have, how can those, how can the social world that they grow up into encourage their, the, self-giving side of them along with and not just the selfish side. So to put this graphically, if we take sort of an abstraction of the human being as having both naturally selfish and naturally primordially and spontaneously giving sides, and that this human self goes through a dynamic developmental life process as moving through growing up, that self works through different complex social, institutional, and cognitive emotional processes, and those processes will affect whether the natural giving or the natural selfish side becomes more dominant. Some of them could and do promote more, a more stingy side, and so the size of the, the, height, the triangle on the top, that is the self-giving side, sort of atrophies, and others of them uh, can promote more generosity. So I approach the whole question of generosity. What are these complex social, institutional, cognitive, emotional processes that help in some people to make them more generous and, and other people not? So 
That's the human nature side as a background setting up the more empirical side. So the next thing I want to say is I, I, what I'm thinking I've learned in the science of generosity is how incredibly complex this is. When I first went into studying this, some of you I know are long, knew this a long time ago and could have told me. When I first went into studying generosity and in my particular interest is money, I thought this will be easy. We have a metric. Many things in social life, there's not a natural metric, but at least you, dollars are dollars, you know, and so, and we can count them, and there's records of this. I thought, finally, I have something concrete and straightforward to study. It turns out it's incredibly complex and difficult, and so it back, back to where all the rest of social science is, that studying generosity turns out to be really complex. I just want to throw out a few things. Again, you probably know, but I think it's always helpful to remember this is not easy stuff. This is complicated stuff. Just the question of why people give, and very many studies show people can give for all sorts of different reasons. Um, solicitation, need, benefit, altruism, reputation. There's a lot that goes into it's not It's not simple and straightforward why people give. Another, uh, another uh, huge complexity in all social science, but in, in clearly in here, is the difference between simply identifying what are the demographics of people who give more, which isn't that hard, versus what are the causal mechanisms related to those demographics that actually produce the giving. So it's, that is showing the causal processes rather than just identify this is more, that's less. So knowing that certain kinds of Americans, like college educated or religious, tend to give more money, doesn't it in and of itself explain how or why? And getting at the how or why through research is much more complicated than getting at the who. Another complication, just in a very simple analytical sense, is um, who are the people that give any money, that is one dollar compared to one plus compared to any, compared to zero, versus how much people give. And the factors related to who's a giver versus a not a giver usually turn out to be quite different than the factors among the givers who tends to give more. So there's all these complex sub-questions. And then, of course, there's the question of causal direction. Which of the factors cause giving? How much does, being, does giving cause some of the factors, or both, et cetera? Uh, another massive uh, complexity has to do with uh, inaccuracy in people's awareness and reporting. I mean, what, I'm a pretty organized person, and one thing I learned interviewing lots of Americans for this project is huge go uh, chunks of Americans have no idea what's going on in their household financially. They don't know what's coming in. They don't know where it's going. And to try to study that and to get them to talk reasonably about it, it's impossible. So, uh, but take the question of tithing. So in our survey, we, we asked, do you tithe? And then later in the survey, we asked, do you give 10% of your income, which is a different question. <laughs> and then later in the, elsewhere in the survey, we had very precise like 20 different areas of life that mon money could be given to and how much that year was so we could add it up, compare it to their income, which we also found out, and see how all those things added up. So 23% of the people of our survey people said, I regularly donate at least 10% of my income to religious, charitable, or other good causes. Well, we happen to know that the actual number of those is about 2 or 3%. So there's a huge number of people that think they are, or would like others to think they are, giving 10% of their income when, I'm not saying they're liars, I'm saying when you try to research this, or when you try to raise money from people, we're talking about gross inaccuracies. On the other hand, and this is very interesting too, one-third of those who, according to the dollars they reported to us vis-a-vis -vis their income, who do give 10% of their income, said no to the above question. Like they didn't realize or think of themselves as giving away 10% of their income. So there's the, 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 the disjunct between reality and people's awareness of what their own reality is can be huge. And that presents a huge research challenge, and I'm sure it presents a huge challenge if you're a minister or if you work for a nonprofit trying to get people's brains aligned with reality. So. Uh, this is all still the wind-up to what I have to say, and my time is <laughs> probably half over. So the third thing I want to talk about are what are some of these social, institutional, and cognitive emotional dynamics? In our analysis, um, the two most consistent and strong factors, so now I'm going back to actually the demographic piece. What are the kind of people that tend to give more or things associated with the kind of people? 
There's value to that, so I'm going to run through some of these. But then the work we have to do is really think about if those are the kind of people, what are the causal mechanisms associated with that, and how can those be implemented to try to encourage more people to be generous. But the two most consistent and strong factors from our analysis and our data, the first one is that somewhere along the line, earlier in life, the people who gave more had made a prior decision to give. And from, from, my, from my best understanding of this, basically some people confront the existential question, do I want to be a giver? Am I somebody that gives away, that shares, or am I not? And then among those people, some people end up saying, yeah, I do, and I'm going to do that. But until people confront the existential question, like I need to decide what kind of a person I am, how I'm going to behave in the world, until somebody does that, and until they say, yes, I am going to, they, it's very easy not to give that much money away. It's very easy to just sort of let all those questions pass on the side. So prior decision to give more. And second, the routinization of giving method. That is, once people have given, the people that give generously have figured out a habit. They've figured out one way or another the percentage, the dollar amount, the envelope, whatever it is. And this is because these kind of activities are so cognitively costly that to continually think all the time, did I give, how am I going to, it's not going to happen. I've been on vacation, I forgot this. And, so to give a lot of money requires people structure it into their life routine so they don't even have to think about it. Now there's a paradox here because I just said the first thing is people need to really confront an existential thing and think about it. And then they need to figure out ways to stop thinking about it and just make it happen. <laughs> you get that? So this creates a very interesting, uh, the other part of this number two is, how do you get people to routinize it so much that they don't have to think about it so much without them completely forgetting about it and, f and not thinking about what is it the good I'm doing in the world? So sometimes in churches I get asked, could we just set up a credit card kiosk in the narthex? And so, I mean, that's a good question, is that how routinized to make it before it becomes self-defeating? Anyway, these factors are huge. On a completely different level, personality, beliefs, and values, this is not rocket science, but it really, really makes a difference. People's view toward the world, their sense of their self, and their attitudes or their beliefs about the world. There are some people who really think everyone has a social responsibility to take care of everyone else. And there are some people that don't think that. They think, I'm I mean, these are very interesting conversations at their kitchen table when people say, I'm responsible for my own ass and everyone else is responsible for theirs and that's the end of the story. I don't know anybody anything. That, not surprisingly, makes a big difference if people are willing to share of their resources with other people. Generally, a, a view of, uh, like an ont a social ontology of social solidarity, that is, we're all interdependent upon each other. Human, hum, humans need each other. That view is also very, very much people that give generously have that view as opposed to an atomistic, individualistic view of things. And then to personally identify as a self to say, I'm a generous giver. To be able to have part of one's repertoire of identities, I'm somebody who gives. I'm a generous person. That clearly, now again, we get to, which is the cause and effect here, I can't say. But to have this embedded in a sense of self, not just an external behavior that I took care of, is associated with generous giving. Uh, another factor is um, perceptions of the world. We know that the, how generous people are and people's capacity to be generous are extremely loosely correlated. There's a very loose coupling between the resources people have to give and how much they do give, right? And that's because between the amount of income somebody has and whether they give that is their perception of the kind of the world they live in. And one of the key piece perceptions is, do we live in a world of abundance or scarcity? And, we, and somebody can be super rich and think they live in a world of scarcity, and somebody could really not have much and understand themselves as living in a world of abundance, of a blessing, of I'm not going to fall apart if I share with somebody else. So there's this, again, this is existential question of what kind of world do I live in? And people that give away money, more money, understand themselves as blessed, as having a lot. That Look at how much there is around us. Look at how much I have. And then from that they see that what they're doing is it's overflowing to people around them. Whereas, and again, this has nothing to do with savings and income, uh, 
people can look at the world as, I'm always threatened, something could go wrong tomorrow, I better plan, I better hold on to what I have, I can't share it. Those kind of people obviously don't give away much money. Also, how materialistic people are, just how much pleasure people get in shopping and buying things is very strong. So the people that tend to give away more money are those that don't really think that if you die with the most toys, you win. I'm sorry. Uh, so they just don't take, they don't take life satisfaction in terms of material possessions. And so that opens them up to an understanding of um, life, what they want to spend their money on experiences more than things, and a certain kind of experiences sharing with others and making change happen in the world and helping to support causes and organizations that they believe in and so on and so on. So the divide between a thing, a materialistic, a thing-oriented world versus an experience and uh, uh, not worried about continually acquiring things is uh, one of a small handful of these things that I'm talking about that relate to giving more money. Um, two other factors, I'm finally getting around to religion here. Uh, people that give more money had parents who gave more money and taught them to give. So again, this is not rocket science, but it's really important. Um, little kids are Impress, I mean, it just, if it forms, it seems to form people for life. When they grew up in a family, their parents just gave money away and told them this is how you live, this is just what you do. And a lot of very, a lot of quite generous people that we interviewed, um, pretty much most of them were religious, uh, uh, and they didn't have a lot of resources, but they gave a lot of their money away. They didn't even think about what they were doing. I mean, they weren't even proud of it, they just thought, I'm just living. I mean, isn't this what people, what you're supposed to do? So there wasn't even this, wow, I'm so great, and let me tell you. It was just like, I guess that's what I, I mean, it was almost not unselfconsciously, this is just what a good human being does, and I want to be a good human being, is what my parents did. And um, they may be part of the one-third that doesn't report that they give 10%. So parent modeling and teaching is important. Obviously, we know this, although I'm going to get around to, some people are now questioning this, religious service attendance, um, a frequent uh, a service, a religious service attendance, also associated with giving more money, especially when within the religious services there are more explicit calls to give. Now, there are some religious congregations where money is never talked about. I've interviewed some pastors who are terrified to talk about money. They hate, it's the thing they hate about their job the most. Uh, they feel like they're raising their own salary, and it makes them just completely uncomfortable. So within religious congregations, there's a whole spectrum of how the question is addressed. And, but one way or another, um, those people give more who not only attend religious services more, but are in religious services where it's directly said, you need to be somebody who gives money, et cetera, et cetera. Um, social networks, this is something sociologists are interested in. Uh, one of the people we funded, Nicholas Christakis at Harvard, now at Yale, has shown in lots and lots of research how powerful social networks are. People's body weight is very much affected by their place in social networks and the body weight of all sort of people they're connected to and all the people they're connected to. So the likelihood of somebody becoming very, uh, a very heavy is, is significantly affected by who they know. So, and, and social networks affects tons of things in the world. And so the main point here is that um, people give more who are surrounded by people who give more and believe in giving more. So whether one is married, again, this is not rocket science, but it's good to know whether people are married to somebody who believes in it and supports it and shares the same view of giving or who's sort of dragging their feet and why you're giving away all this money for, that we need for our vacation home or whatever. Um, people who have friends who are givers. People who perceive that their local community is populated by people who are generous are more likely to give. Now, this is to pure correlation. It could be, we have all the open questions in this case of how do the causal directions and ordering and work and through perceptions and so on. But the basic point is um, giving is not just an individual or even a household thing. It's connected to relationships, it's connected to networks, it's connected to social influence that happens in relationships and communication. Okay, so those are some cognitive institutional uh, and social uh, dynamics that I'm gonna circle around to in a bit. But before I do that, I'll say one more thing on uh, sort of influences, 
and that is everything, much of social science research operates on the model, if you know statistics of multiple regression, independent variables, that is the effect of a variable net of the effect of every other variable in the model. And that's one way to do things, but it's also severely limited. Another way to think about it is what combinations of factors tend to go cluster together empirically to give rise to more giving. Or if you think about, um, you can't make a cake by just setting ingredients on the table separately. You have to mix them together, right, and put them in a certain conditions of heat and so on uh, for you to get a cake. So if we think about generous giving as a cake, so to speak, an outcome, what ingredients need to, what are the recipes that could, that, that in the real world tend to give rise to more generous giving? This set, this analysis sets aside the existential decision and the routinization. It focuses on the more proximate variables. And this is, if you care about this stuff, it's called fuzzy set and QCA analysis. But here are the recipes that give rise to more generous giving. And they're, co they're color coded. The, the darkest is, has to do with personal identity. I'm a generous person. Um, the orange is parental modeling. The green is a religious attendance where there's um, calls for giving and the blue is one form or another of social network. And you can see that there are clusters of these things. There's strong patterning. There, there, I don't have time to go into, you can see right here, this actually lower personal identity and lower spousal alignment. You must have lower in this combination, but it's made up for all these other things. So it's very complicated, I don't have time to go into it. But here's what I'm gonna say in my way of summary observation. Every recipe has high social network support for giving. There are few to no loan givers out there. This is, giving money is not a, it, not a process that people figure out in their heads and do. Whether or not Jesus said do it so nobody can see what you're doing is a separate question, but the way th things work in this culture and society, how much people give is very much affected by who they know and who they know's attitude and behaviors toward giving. So the, 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 atomis, the atomism again of the behavior we need to question. It's a social network dynamic. Also, four of the five recipes require religious calls to give. And the one recipe that did not include religious calls had all the other, every one of the other social network factors at work together, spouse, parents, friends, community, and there's a, 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 in community here we also wrapped in national perception. Are you part of a, a, a society that is generous? Another observation is four out of the five recipes require parental modeling and teaching to give. So there's really something about a long-term life formation and trajectory from childhood that people learn uh, that affects their giving. The one recipe that did not include parental modeling and teaching had all other positive social networks effect, effects again. So let's think about some action implications. I'm gonna say a whole list of, if you wanna encourage people to be more, more generous in giving money, these are the sort of things that we could do. I know that every one of these, you're gonna reply by saying, well, how do I do that? And I'm gonna say, I don't know, that's what you have to figure out. But these are, <laughs> these are the, in principle, if these things could be done, conceptually, probably they should lead to more generous giving. One is to find ways to help more people confront the existential question of giving and to make a decision. That is to stop ignoring the question, to really, really confront what kind of person do I wanna be? Uh, in the book, that, uh, in the book uh, Passing the Plate, we coined this idea of comfortable guilt. That there are a lot of people out there who feel guilty because they're not giving what they wish they were giving. They want to be more generous. They can't quite get themselves to do that, and they feel guilty about it. But they're not so uncomfortable that they're going to do anything about it. So they're comfortably guilty about it. But it means they're cognitively, they're aware of it, and there's some tension going on, just not enough. Um, so, but getting people to confront it and make a decision one way or another, that's one idea. Another is to encourage routine giving one way or another, to minimize the cognitive cost through habituation. The other is to somehow surround people with others who are generous givers. Although the next point I think is important, and that is people may be surrounded by others who are generous givers and not know it, because very many people don't want to brag about their giving. So a huge question is, if the social network finding is true, how can we get people to talk properly about their giving that encourages others to give that doesn't sound like tooting their own horn, bragging, all the negatives that we would associate with that? How, how can we talk 
openly about, I really believe in this and I support it and I give in a way that doesn't turn people off. I think that's a really big question because people can be surrounded by others who are generous and not know it if people aren't talking about it. Or another way to put that is, how can generous people encourage the ones around them to be generous without it turning people off, coming off as obnoxious, grandstanding, etc. Uh, religious congregations need somehow to figure out more how to make direct, explicit calls and not be apologetic, to not be avoiding and saying this, this, and, and my, the, I don't have time for this, but I have a whole thing in this first book about, in religious congregations, there's, a, there's kind of a, two different ways this is approached. One is, look folks, if you're part of this organization, we have bills to pay, so cough it up. <laughs> and uh, the other is, we have a vision for what we're trying to do here. We're on a mission, we're doing something great in the world, this is really important, and you would be lucky to get on board it. The, so the living the vision, I think, gets people more energized and jazzed to be more, because people want to be part of something bigger. Most of life is pathetically boring and horrible, right? So people want to be, if, they, if people can get a vision of something bigger themselves that really matters, that they actually could have influence over, they can get excited about that. But what's not exciting is, you know, we can't pay our electric bill, so here comes the plate. So it, the, the type of calls for giving clearly matters here. Parents uh, need to be encouraged to, now this won't take effect for another 10, 20, 30 years, but parents should be encouraged to teach their children. I, myself, my, at one point, m my wife and I realized we give all this money and our kids have no idea. They're completely clueless. So we were j finally we just realized, you know what? We should sit down and tell them what we're doing and why we're doing it. Not a big deal, but just teach them. Otherwise, it could go right over their heads. So again, figuring out how to be explicit, but appropriately explicit and teaching about it. Um, somehow, don't ask me how, but to cultivate against, don't ask me how against concern, uh, commercialism and everything, but to cultivate an, atti an attitude of abundance and gratitude. That I live in a world that's got plenty in it, and in my household we have plenty, and I'm thankful for that. That completely reframes reality in a way that enables the people to be generous. If it's not reframed that way, people are not going to be generous. They're going to protect themselves. Cultivate life satisfaction, not in material possessions, but in good life experiences, including world change through generous giving. Cultivate a belief in human interdependence and solidarity and responsibility, and encourage people to identify somehow with, I am a generous giver to causes I believe in, to get people to own that, to think of themselves that way, um, and, and to communicate it to others. All right, I'm out of time, but I'm gonna go over a little bit because the next thing is interesting and not, and not too much longer, but uh, do religious Americans really give more money than non-religious Americans? It's common knowledge that of course they do, but this has become uh, questioned recently, and there are two issues in this. One is conceptual and one is empirical. The conceptual question is, if most religious giving is to one's own congregation, is that really generous or is that self-serving? Um, is it charitable or is it just helping one's kids to have a good place to go once a week sort of thing. I mean, this is the conceptual question. Should it count as charitable giving to give to your congregation? That can be extended in all, I mean, that, it raises huge conceptual questions about what counts as generous, et cetera, but the, this is the question that's being put on the table. The other is empirical, and some people are saying, I don't think religious people actually give that much more if you look at it right or, take seriously inconclusive studies and so on. So I just want to address this really quickly and then I'll be done. Uh, here's an example though, does, uh, from an article published last year by Roy uh, Sablowski, does religion foster generosity? And basically says, I don't think so. I think we need to give up the idea that religion actually makes anybody more generous. So these are just data from my Science of Generosity survey. Our data, at least, say absolutely, whether it's measured in terms of religious service attendance or importance of religious faith, um, Religious people are much more likely to donate money and to donate more money. Also, I'm not going to take the time here, but um, a little bit more than half of the money that regular religious service attenders give goes to religion. So the huge, a, a major minority chunk of their money doesn't go to religion. No, they're not just giving to religion. And then the question is, um, when that all pans out, uh, how much uh, of religious giving 
uh, goes to not religious causes. And so the, this is the final slide. Among givers, that is, if you take people off the table who don't give anything, of which there are more than a few, monthly plus religious service attenders give nearly the same to non-religious causes as infrequent and non-attenders, which is to say religious giving is above and beyond non-religious giving, not a substitute for it, if that makes sense to you. So my answer to the question, do religious Americans really give more money than non-religious Americans, is yes.